Hello and welcome. I'm Pankaj Pachodi, and today we are going to talk about a subject which has been under scrutiny for last at least four decades, and that is China, and more so India's relationship with China. Both are great civilizations, very old civilizations, huge, huge countries with huge, huge potentials, but no one has been able to put their finger on the pulse of these two giants of Asia, which are certainly and surely going to rule the world one day. With me, I have Pradeep Bajal, who's been a civil servant in India, an IS officer who has worked as the secretary to the government of India in different capacities. He's been an architect of India's disinvestment policy in 1999. And after that, he has been at the top of India's current leadership in the world, and that's telecom. So he has been the chairman of TRAI, now retired, and in an absolutely new avatar. Bajal sir, welcome to the studio. Thank you. And tell us about this book you are writing, which is called Containing the China Onslaught. Mm -hmm. Why and how is it different? Look, many books have been written on the subject. <coughs> but I have uh, written a book uh, on this subject a book which has never been written before. I have examined uh, different issues. You see, <coughs> in the phenomenal growth of China, there are many issues, economic, historical, geographical, foreign rule, intrigue, deception, financial jugglery, like for instance, US had a lot of its growth through financial jugglery. <coughs> now, all other people who have written books, either they have been economists, or they have been political scientists or diplomats. Now, they don't see the entire world of growth of a country. I have been fortunate that I worked in uh, <coughs> all the reform departments of government of India, and I was very closely involved with all the issues, BRICS report, this, that, and the other. So I had an uh, insider's view. Luckily for me, government of India had trained me in uh, intensively also. Government of India sent me to <coughs> Japan on a training, it sent me to Harvard, it sent me to Oxford, long trainings on uh, reforms. So therefore, what I have given uh, to the reader is number one, an insider's view, number two, a view from the ground level, and number three, I've examined many issues which no other book has examined, and I've come to different conclusions and also conclusions which are relevant for India, because I'm an Indian, so I have, yeah. I have examined China more so from the point of view of India. So the vantage point is basically India, which yes. is very interesting, <coughs> because everyone has been betting their money on that in the future, China and India are going to be the two uh, friends or enemies, which are this huge dragon and elephant. And uh, people have been saying that, uh, it's like trying to uh, find out how an uh, elephant looks like by a blind man when you look at China and you look at you see, India. You see, today, <coughs> there is no comparison. China is there and India is here. And look at the uh, growth curves. In the growth curve, if you see, then till 1990, we were uh, the same, same yes, GDP. Yes. 1995, we were the same GDP. Even 2000. We were the same GDP. Even 2005, we were the same GDP. Now, 2000, 2005, the same GDP means in the same uh, league. Same league. Yeah. And you see this on the graph, uh, which is before yeah. you. In this graph, you see up to 2005, it was the same. <coughs> yeah. The growth suddenly started out of, uh, suddenly started in 2005. Goldman Sachs, a very big company, also examined India and China. And they wrote a report, popularly known as the BRICS report. Yes. In 2000, in the BRICS report, India and China and uh, Brazil, all these countries were in the same league. And the B Goldman Sachs said that these countries are growing, I don't know what will happen. <coughs> they did not realize what was happening in China. Suddenly in 2005, China shot up. Yes. Now, how and why 
This happened, I have intensively examined in this book. Because everyone thinks that the Chinese growth is a function of Deng. Mm. Who said famously that uh, the color of the uh, cat doesn't matter yes. as long as it catches mice. Yes, you have cut, you have cut the key phrase. You see, it was only... Uh, let me go back to Mao first, then I'll okay. come to Deng. Okay. <coughs> Surprisingly, the growth of China was planned and designed by Mao and not Deng. Uh, Michael Pillsbury has written a book. And that book says that when, in 1950, uh, Mao came into China, he wrote a book, 100 Years Marathon, where he charted out uh, a plan of 100 years and he said that we owe it to the world that we overtake uh, United States and he wrote a program and he started implementing that program and what was that program? That program was the Great Leap Forward. The great leap forward. Yes. When he did that, there was total chaos and he realized he couldn't do it. The cultural revolution and Absolutely the right. problems Absolutely. So China he, he, faced. He that. just couldn't do it. So he told his uh, friends that bring in United States. They know how to grow, bring in United States. So no one knows this. I have uh, researched and researched. I've been to all these countries to research. So <coughs> he said bring in China. When they approached, uh, sorry, bring in US. When they approached US, US said no, nothing doing. We will not uh, get into uh, this is China. This the Kissinger time. When they before, were, that, oh, before, before that. Before that. Kissinger also said, nothing doing, and he opposed the China policy always. Then he thought of, uh, he thought of the Chinese stratagems, and he thought, let me surround the United States. So what he did was, he sent a lot of his sympathizers, like de Gaulle, like uh, Conrad Ednard, like Yahya Khan, like uh, Lee Kuan Yew, he sent them to the US president. And they told the U.S. president that, look, China is in one corner and it will, it's 1.3 billion people. They will create chaos in this world. This world will be, uh, this world uh, will no longer exist because they'll fight. So it is in our interest to take them into the U.S. Uh, sphere of influence. Hold, as they say, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In the U.S. hold. Kissinger said no. So, they sent people to Nixon, when Nixon was uh, standing for election. And uh, uh, Mao thought that Nixon, who is uh, egoistic and he is self-opinionated, if I, if I can uh, convince him, things will move. So, Lee gave him the draft of an article that why should uh, the world cooperate with China? So, Nixon wrote that article in 1967 in the Republican Party General Foreign Affairs mm. as his own article. 1968, when he unexpectedly win, uh, won the election, then that article became the, uh, uh, the, 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 the government policy. So, Nixon then wanted to meet uh, Mao. But Mao, again, uh, deception is a part of uh, Chinese culture. It is in 36 stratagems, their philosophy. At that stage, Mao did not encourage meeting with uh, this fellow, uh, meeting with Nixon. With great difficulty, you will remember that uh, Kissinger came to Dhaka, Yahya yes, Khan, yes, yes. took him in his own, uh, uh, in his own plane. Time, the world thought that Kissinger has come here because of the Bangladesh war, war. at that time, it was before Bangladesh war. So he went surreptitiously to uh, China. Ma Mao didn't show much interest, surprisingly, because Mao knew that if he shows interest, this deal will not happen. So then uh, Kissinger came, to, uh, to uh, Beijing, Beijing yeah. Mao knew the wily man that he was that uh, US needs our support. They are fighting a cold war with Soviet Russia and they wanted the China support in that cold war with uh, Soviet Russia. So Mao said yes we can have a deal and all these people went back from Beijing.
when they went back from Beijing, there was a huge furor in the Communist Party. So Mao didn't know what to do. So he sacrificed Deng, and Deng went to jail. Yes. He, I mean, this is this is like not many. This is a very deep down yes. thing. Let let us read the book about all this. Let's get back to what China and India were, and how they have diverged. And now they are coming back again. I mean, if we uh, look at the world and how the uh, GDP of the world is behaving lately, China and India are going to play a very important role. Look, everyone asks me this question. At present, India is nowhere in comparison to China. China is in the same league as the United States. We are in the same league of a developing nation. You see, when I was studying this, so I thought, let me look at... Uh, uh, what happened in the world. Now, if you look at this graph <coughs> from 1 AD till about 18, uh, till about 1830, we were uh, the highest GDP in the world, China and India. Yeah, this was the, uh, the Sone Ki Chudiya period yes, of India. Yes. Huh? These two countries had 50% of the world's GDP. Yeah. But then what happened in uh, 1830? The first industrial revolution started, the second industrial revolution started. Those countries were educated, we were not educated, and therefore they had a massive growth. First, it was Britain, whose growth increased massively. They moved away from agriculture to production Absolutely. and manufacturing. Then you come to the United States, Henry Ford came, he started the, uh, the, the vehicle line, and then uh, US grew suddenly, and from a level of 50% in about 1820, Ch uh, China and India came down in 1970 to 5%. From waterfall, 50% to 5% in a couple of years. But then they've grown, <coughs> grown up again. Hold on. But 1970, because both of them became independent in 1950, almost 1950. Almost same time. So, 1950, whereas India didn't know what to do, India was confused whether it was non-aligned, whether it was the Russian uh, league, whether it was it could go to China. India was highly obliged to Russia because of Bangladesh war. Another thing had happened during Bangladesh war. Nixon also examined whether we should mm. partner with India or China, so and they the said, and they said we will not partner with uh, we will not partner with India because that is headed by a bitch. It's written. I'm not yeah, saying yeah. this. Huh. He said Indira Gandhi is a bitch. So therefore, uh, some people say it's which, whatever. <laughs> so, so <laughs> Mao knew all this and he took advantage, and he had a deal with the with the United States in 1970s. And when there was uh, noise, he gave up uh, Deng, and Deng went to jail. He went to jail to the extent that his son was beaten up uh, so much that he's on the wheelchair. I have got some photographs with uh, De uh, Deng's son on the wheelchair and lots in his family uh, there. Then came the Gang of Four, Mao died, came the Gang of Four, they also further sent him to jail. Then suddenly came in a uh, Chinese general and suddenly Deng became the president in 1978, suddenly, without anyone expecting. When he became the president, the first thing he did Within the first 15 days, he went to Singapore. Because all the time, Lee Kuan Yew was his guru. He went to Singapore. This is how capitalism, that's how the cat changes color. Absolutely. Okay. And Deng always said that I don't bother about the cat's color as long as she delivers. In India, we said we are very bothered. We have, we are non-aligned, we are Russian mm -hmm. bloc, etc., etc. So he immediately... Not the color. We'll say about cat which direction it's going to... And he said... It's going to Vastu or not. Yes. We'll be very much worried about cat. And he... Uh, this, uh, Deng said... No. Uh, Lee said that if you want to learn, go to Japan. And Japan was the greatest enemy of China always. So he went to Japan. He went to Japan and got his training from uh, the Japanese Prime Minister. And he said that if you bring in new, new ideas, lots of flies come. So you have to learn what to keep and what to throw out. So Deng was prepared for any kind of dialogue. This happened till about 1989. But by this time, US realized that uh, <coughs> China was growing too fast. Number one. Number two, 
then get convinced the U.S. president that I will keep uh, uh, communism. Because if I don't keep communism, we will collapse like Soviet Russia. Yeah. And Soviet Russia had collapsed. Now let me go back to one more incident which happened during that period. You see, <coughs> U.S. only wanted to win the Cold War. And when they won the Cold War, suddenly, without a single bullet being fired, entire Soviet bloc uh, went. 16 countries, yeah. Yes. <coughs> there was no need for U.S. to continue helping China, because China everyone recognized would be a dragon. But they helped because all the presidents after Nixon were brain dead. It has been written in books, it's not my <laughs> word. They were brain dead. And why were they brain dead? Because they had thought we are the greatest in the world. We uh, won the Cold War without a single bullet being fired. So they tolerated. <coughs> But they kept saying democracy, bring democracy, but uh, Deng they knew. They did not press. No, no, Deng knew that if he brings in democracy, all this growth would be over. Yeah. So, <coughs> CIA, again, I'm, I'm quoting from books. So, CIA planned the Tiananmen agitation. Oh, the Tiananmen Square, the famous. Yes, that was planned by CIA. Deng got to know this. So he also planned that he will kill uh, 30,000 people. And there are records showing his discussions with generals mm -hmm. that uh, they will send tanks, etc. And after the Tiananmen Square incident, he had a meeting with all the generals and both sides are laughing, they are shaking hands, etc. for a successful operation. But by this time, there was furor in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And not only that, there was furor against Deng, even in China. Hmm. And they wanted to sack uh, Deng. At this stage, Bush wrote a letter of support to uh, Deng. And it is because of this that Deng did not again go to jail. And please remember, when Tiananmen Square happened, uh, Deng was not the president. The president was someone else. Yeah, taken over. He, he, had, yeah. he had only been given charge of the army. So perhaps the entire establishment of China knew how things are happening. There's another very interesting thing. So this is the time of great change in China also. I remember 1989 and that's how the Western <coughs> minds, they cannot understand China. 1989, the cover story of The Economist was that China is going to land, whether it's be a, it will be a soft landing or hard landing. So they've got it so wrong. 30 years on, China is still not landed. No, no, I have said, I have said that uh, the presidents were brain dead, the country was brain dead. Mm -hmm. They did not see that China had its own plan. And what was that plan? 100 years marathon, which Absolutely. was written by Mao. And which is showing now yeah. that the Chinese economy, as your book says, and this is one of the things which is like really mind-blowing in this book, now the Chinese economy is going to be bigger than the uh, economy of the rest of the world by 2060. Absolutely. That's I, amazing. Yes, yes. So what I have done is, what I have done is that uh, I have taken the present growth of China 6.5% and I have taken the present growth of the world 3.3%. So 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 percent, which is when yes. you are happy. Yes, yeah. and <laughs> 2070 and 2060, they will exceed the GDP of the rest of the world. Now, please understand the implications. No one is understanding the implications of this. The implications and this is like 40 are, years away. It's like in our lifetime. And the no, no. In your lifetime, it was three percent to fifty percent also, which I have, which I have explained. Yeah. So, <coughs> the implications would be that eighteen percent of the world will have fifty percent GDP, mm. and that eighteen percent of the world would be communist and fascist, and would not be a country. It's a civilization. They treat themselves as a civilization. Yeah. And their understanding is a tributary model of the world. That I am China and everything else is tributary. This, is, this has been happening since the Xing dynasty. Absolutely the right. Xing dynasty. Uh, you know, all these dynasties, this is how they've been thinking. Yes. And we do not understand that when we discuss China. And particularly, and particularly, they have been, uh, they have been great enemies of Japan, always. Because Japan had conquered the next them, etc. They are great enemies of India also. And the greatest reason for their being the greatest enemy is to give uh, refuge to Dalai Lama. 
because Dalai Lama is a very uh, important person in this story. Please. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to t- uh, talk <coughs> about this. When, let, let's, uh, let's go by your uh, hypothesis. Uh, China becomes half of the world's economy, 18% of population. India, by that time, will be 20% of population. Ed- and we have no idea where India is going. We'll discuss that later. Yeah. But <coughs> between China and India, if we look at the numbers from 1991, when the reforms really started, and you were part of that in finance ministry at that time, if I remember, and now uh, this disjunct between China's growth and India's growth is remarkable, and we can see the numbers there. If you look at yes, uh, yes. Uh, if you if you look at the numbers on this slide, yeah. you know China uh, was say uh, particularly the parameters. China, uh, uh, India, for instance, had a high percentage. Uh, in agriculture. China also had a very high yes. percentage in agriculture. But suddenly, you find that their agriculture population has gone down because they effectively shifted people to rural industries. And there was a process by and which why? they shifted. Because they were able to get the money from the rest of the world. Or your Morgan Stanley's and <laughs> Goldman Sachs, <laughs> they invested in China. And that's our next you know, slide. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. You know, they understood how they understood how to get the money from the world and invest in projects which give them a return, so their GDP goes up, mm-hmm. and they invest in a manner that there is no crony capitalism. They were able to prevent crony capitalism. We were not able to prevent crony capitalism. But that's the government holding everything, so the government itself Absolutely, is absolutely. But then, if you are holding the party as well as government, then you have to be very forward-looking. And on that, I have <coughs> enough material that the person who guided China was another Chinese, Lee Kuan Yew. Because he had so grown... Lee Kuan Yew, you are saying, I mean, he changed the face of not one but two countries. Absolutely. Singapore and China. Singapore first. We can first. never look at the kind of investment China has seen, which is mind-boggling. And India is now reaching at that level, yes. I think. And uh, we can go yes. to that in a while and see. This that. investment also was done very intelligently. If you see this uh, graph, yeah. uh, there is suddenly a spurt in the investment in China. That it is in year year 1990, 1990. You see that spurt. Mm. Now, how did they get that spurt? They got that spurt because China played a judo trick. And what was the judo trick? US was interested in the Chinese market. Mm. They, they examined whether it should be the Indian market or the Chinese market. Both were the this same the population. When, the, when Japanese investment was the highest in America. 80s, yes, absolutely yeah, right, 80s. absolutely yeah. right. So about 80s, they looked around <coughs> and they started investing uh, in China. China assured that the systems worked in India. And, and, and they n- knew nothing. For instance, I remember they wanted to privatize and disinvest. They couldn't do it because they had no Birlas or Tatas or someone to buy. So they allowed the foreign governments to buy, foreign countries to buy. They mm. had big problems. So when I was working in privatization, I found that we did much better than uh, Russia or China. We sold a small amount of equity. They sold huge amounts of equity in their disinvestment. We did not allow the BSNLs, the railways and all these to be taken over by other countries when China did. Are you well, saying that? Well, we allowed VSNL to VSNL, be taken yeah, over. By no, them. but in our case, because we had Tatas and Reliance ah, and Birlas, so we had tra- entrenched. We had well entrenched what people. What you call native capitalist? Yes. Ah. Whereas these people had nothing. They didn't even have a stock market, so they couldn't uh, do capitalism. So therefore, they put themselves in the hands of uh, U.S. and Deng knew that U.S. will help intelligently because it is their uh, brief to increase the China's GDP so that their market goes up. But what judo trick he played was that he did not allow the market to go out. He invested U.S. corporates to invest in China. Mm. And what was the uh, lollipop? The lollipop was that your labor rate is 20, my labor rate is 1. 
so all the american corporates rushed to china the toy china toy story yes and when they rushed to china the entire world got deindustrialized india uh, the world europe got deindustrialized this is very important uh, this is the first time i'm uh, hearing this uh, phrase and if it's your coin you should be congratulated on this <laughs> deindustrialization I mean, this is something we never thought of that the industry could move from rich countries to poorer countries for cheaper labor but then the rich country are going to face the problems as they are doing now yes so they then they started facing the problem and that was the time when there was rethinking in the us and they said we can't handle uh, china it's too disciplined a country mm -hmm. so let us have democracy let us have some confusion then we will send our institution etc and we'll play around play along mm -hmm. this they couldn't do now so the judo trick was that markets they didn't get but they got all the manufacturing industries so the muscle the weight no they got all the manufacturing industries and they flooded the world with the chinese goods those were chinese goods produced by mncs and mncs made a huge profit uh, from those companies but china kept them under control because of this and and they they are very proud of this that uh, growth with chinese characteristics and what is that growth with chinese characteristics that you control everything it's a controlled capitalism controlled capitalism that's, absolutely that, but they were part of wto and all that oh and, that, that 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 showed that played yes, a very yes, important role yes. because russia and india is still like you know we are still let me let uh, me explain let me explain hmm. 1989 uh tiananmen square took place so there was no question that they should get uh, membership of uh, WTO. But they got membership in 2001. Hmm. Russia also started, uh, 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 yes, Russia also started uh, uh, going to uh, a democratic form and capitalism, etc. Hmm. But Russia was not allowed to get uh, WTO membership till 2012. So you see in this graph that uh, in Russia there was a dip in growth, yes, whereas right. in China, as far as trade is concerned, uh, they stayed, China they stayed at par. Yeah. From they, ten percent and eleven percent, they are down to six percent, seven percent. But that is double of the world. Yes, so I'm not uh, talking of the, that. Pe I'm talking of the period eighties, etc., okay. when they became ten percent, etc. And Another very interesting thing happened that Deng died in uh, 1997, yeah. but the growth is 2005. Mm. The growth is 2005, number one, because in uh, China everything is controlled by Politburo. So the policy is don't go in this direction, then in another direction. Continuity in India, policy. in India, with five year elections or even in US, the policies keep changing. In China, they don't change. So whatever Deng had planned kept going forward. Mm. But Deng had planned to invest money in infrastructural projects. So the in, the the investment is early, Capacity. but the mm. but the profits started coming in 2005. Deng also wanted. He always said the growth with folded hands. Because he didn't want the world to notice that I'm growing too fast. This is very Indian uh, characteristic. This is the Indian banya with his folded no, no. hands. This Aap hamare <laughs> sahab ho, huh? this, which yes. this sounds like that. Almost, almost. But yeah. here it was basically Shenzhen philosophy, the Chinese philosophy, Chinese. etc. <coughs> so he did not want the West to notice that we are growing so far. The notice came, as I showed you in the first slide, yes, in 2005. Right. Deng had long gone. Yes, yes. And then the growth started. India also did a number of things. But India said, look, we have private sector. We know how to run private sector. So uh, we will keep to our rules. And we will make our own rules. Whereas in China, all the rules were made by Singapore and uh, the United States. Because they said, we know nothing. India, we, we are no-alls. We are normally no-alls. <laughs> so we said, we know everything. 
So we made such a mess in power, in telecom, in all the growing sectors. We are in a very, very bad situation right now. And which brings me to our next question. And that is about, you know, uh, what kind of relationship do you think India should be having uh, with the China in the future? Yeah. Because we are both very proud countries. We are both have a very huge civilization. Chinese, uh, the, the uh, Chen dynasty, if I remember rightly, they sent Huyen Sang to come to India and understand Indian uh, culture. And he uh, took back Buddhism from here and blended with Confucian, Confucian uh, theories. And it became a, such a huge uh, power, ideological, intellectual power for China to go forward. India, similarly... You see, have I have said in my book, hmm. why I wrote the book. When I was chairman of TRI, we suddenly had a huge growth for reasons one, two, three. You remember in telecom, we suddenly oh, yes, had a huge growth. Hmm. And uh, I got an invitation from China that I should lecture in Beijing University. Well, so when that lecture took place, uh, there were four Chinese ministers sitting there. And I was surprised why they're sitting there. They, had, they were inquisitive that they should learn how did our growth exceed the Chinese growth. We went three times above uh, China in mobile growth. But we were no alls. We know, knew everything. Chinese at their level of growth were still inquisitive to learn. Now that was something which was trained to them by Li. Li used to get Chinese officials in thousands to Singapore. There's a college in Singapore, brilliant college. I have been there. They are the new Huen Swans. <laughs> we are taking back new uh, philosophy. Yes, yes, yes. Capitalism. So, so uh. Chinese, I don't know why, because till 1990s we were the same breed, India and China. But suddenly, uh, they got uh, governance with Chinese characteristics and they went up very fast. Whereas in China, we did plenty of problems. Uh, in India, we did, uh, we created plenty of problems for its, uh, ourselves. But now, people say, no, China and India are comparative. Look at China. Mm. China is, they, they are doing 28% of the world automobiles. We can do that. Yeah, we are. That, that yes, is they are doing 41% of world ships. They are doing 80% of world's computers. Mm. They, they are way, way, way ahead in, uh, in, uh, in uh, digital and they are way ahead in the fourth the industrial revolution. Largest, the second largest market for the largest American company, which is Apple, is China. Yes, yes. So, America can't pull out of China because it's the second largest market for their largest company and they can't go to China because the Chinese are making more money. Yes, out that, is, that is a very big problem. Because of all this uh, policy of the United States, there is a lot of theft of uh, intellectual capital from uh, yes. the United States. Everything has been copied. Thousands of uh, boys have gone to colleges with only one brief, bring technology. And they brought technology and they've gone ahead. Now, fourth industrial revolution will be highly disruptive. The world will change mm -hmm. after artificial... This has already started happening. This has already started. And China has invested much more than United States in AI, which is surprising because Whose jobs will be affected? China's, who've got the maximum number of people. But China realizes that if we don't master in AI, these Americans will overtake us again. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they've invested huge and they're committing huge thefts. They are breaking all rules of WTO and no one has the guts. And they, and they have firewalled themselves. Absolutely right. All the best of the biggest of the companies yes. of America, Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, all these companies are not available in China. They have their own. Yes, what they've done is these companies had come and then they firewalled them. You're absolutely right. And now they've, they've got their own companies, which even, well, th that's Those a part of, Weibo that, and all these that companies. is a part of growth. Even, even Reliance is doing it today. Today, this Google the no, equation, Reliance, Reliance is also and, yes, absolutely. in doing it also in Reliance Geo. But their policy is after a lot of debate and their policy doesn't change. In India, one of our problems is that our policies keep changing. So in the fourth industrial revolution period, which is highly disruptive, 
and we have some expertise in dealing with computers, I see that India can make a difference and overtake, provided we have uh, policies uh, which are investor friendly, like China had at one point of time. One last question in this uh, uh, whole uh, way forward for this two giant countries. Should they be competing with each other or should they be partnering with each other? You see, look at the partnership between China and uh, America. It, they were both giant countries and they, 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 they partnered with each other and the result was that USA destroyed itself. Now, they are coming back after Trump. They are coming back and Trump is taking some actions. People say that uh, he is not wise. Yeah, absolutely, that could, but, could be a... But uh, he is taking actions after two, 2016 that he is trying to contain China. Now, if our partnership can be on a basis which is fair to both, mm. then it's wonderful. But the problem is that we are 1.3 billion, they are 1.3 billion, we have huge populations. Now, who has got the market and who has got the manufacturing facility? They are far ahead of manufacturing facility. We as partner I, with them. As a, yes, over we nine, should give them what they need, we should get from what we need. Yes, it's a very difficult process, yeah. but my book uh, examines this and says clearly that how should we deal with ourselves in the future. Okay, so that is the concluding part of your book which we will not discuss here. It's not a spoiler like the Game of Thrones. Pradeep Bajal, thank you very much for coming to the studio and uh, all the best and congratulations for this very uh, important work of uh, authorship uh, which is going to be very helpful to students uh, like me and many people. Yes, I believe because uh, I've been a part of reforms, I believe that the test, test uh, th that uh, everything depends on the result. If the book sells, <laughs> then I've written something worthwhile. That's if the book doesn't sell, I've written nothing worthwhile. That is spoken like a Chinese. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.